from our Lakeview Studios in the Windy City. Welcome to tonight's Chicago Python event. Uh, it's going to be our data special interest group event. So thanks everybody for joining. We're really excited to have you. My name is Ali Sivji. I'm one of the organizers of the Chicago Python users group. I'm going to be your host tonight. We got three fantastic talks about data science tools in the Python ecosystem. Let's get started. All right, let me get my slides going. All right, so before I do start, I want to make everybody aware of our code of conduct. Uh, anywhere you're interacting in a chippy space, be it in our live chat, on our Slack, uh, everybody's going to be having to abide by our code of conduct. More information is available on our website. So you're probably wondering, what is Chicago Python? So we are a Python-focused community that started back in 2003. It was really started as a bunch of folks meeting once a month to talk about Python, maybe meeting at a conference room, meeting in the back of a bar. And we've grown to become one of the largest Python communities in the world. We have around 6,000 members. And every month, we hold four to six events. So our main headliners are our main meeting. That happens on the second Thursday of every month. We also have a monthly project night. That happens on the third Thursday of every month. Uh, on top of these events, we have special interest groups that cater to more of a niche application of Python. Uh, this one is the data special interest group. We have one on web development and DevOps. There's also one uh, on algorithms and data structures that's run by Kevin Nasto, Chris Lutke, and Sandip. Just really want to give them a shout out. We did our first virtual algo sig a few weeks ago, and it was a fantastic event. There's going to be another one happening soon, so stay tuned. And then we also have the finance sig, and David Masamura runs that. So what's going on in the world? I don't know if anybody else is excited, but Dino 1.0 just landed. So you might be wondering, what's Dino? So Dino is a JavaScript runtime made by Ryan Dahl. So Ryan Dahl is the guy that created Node. And I'm really excited to see uh, what Dino can do. It's like sort of fixing all the things that Node didn't do right. And he's uh, sort of changed that and put his learnings into Dino. Longtime viewers of this stream will remember that uh, a few weeks ago, I was going to take a week of vacation. Um, did that, but I actually spent my time not going anywhere, sort of stuck at home, but I was learning JavaScript. So uh, one of the things I made was a multiplayer Pong game, had to use Node behind the scenes. So really excited to see uh, what Dino could do, and also really excited to see what this brings about in the Python backend landscape as well. We should probably talk about Python as well, since this is a chippy event. Uh, PyCon videos are online. Uh, all the speakers recorded their talks and they sent them in. And PyCon has been releasing them over the past few weeks in waves, but they are all posted now. So if you go to us.pycon.org, you can find all those talks. And I sort of just want to give a plug. Uh, I actually had a talk accepted at PyCon. I was lucky enough to do that. Uh, my talk, If Statements Are a Code Smell, it's available. Check it out. Hit that like icon. It's really going to help me out. Uh, we do have some upcoming virtual events want to make everybody aware about. Tomorrow night, we're going to have our monthly project night. Uh, we're going to probably just meeting in Slack and then just break off into groups depending on what people want to do. Uh, on June 2nd, we're going to be holding another YouTube live stream. This is going to be for our web dev slash DevOps special interest group. On June 4th, we're going to have our algorithm sig virtual event. June 11th is going to be our next main meeting. And also, I uh, do want to announce our next data sig. Just got some confirmations from our speakers. So we're going to be doing it on Wednesday, June 17th. It's going to be Chippy Data Sig Presents Natural Language Processing. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers. Uh, the first one's going to be Lorena Mesa. If you were involved in the Python community in any capacity, you've probably run into Lorena. She started PyLady Chicago. She sits on the board of the Python Software Foundation. Lorena is going to be talking about generating telenovela scripts using deep learning. Really excited about that. And then the second speaker is going to be Ryan Bales. Ryan is the director of analytics at Dialogue Tech. Uh, I actually met Ryan at a conference at Pi Ohio last year. Uh, he was giving a talk on learning from audio data. I thought it was a fantastic talk. 
Uh, we've been trying to get him to come to Chicago for a while, had to reschedule back in March, but uh, we're excited to have him in, uh, in June. We get a theme night on NLP. It's going to be a lot of fun. I also want to make aware, make everybody aware of where they can find Chippy on the internet. Chippy has a very active Slack workspace. We have around 2,000 members. Uh, that's going to be at joinchippyslack.herokuapp.com. You could send yourself an invite. Uh, you can find us on Twitter. We're always tweeting about what's going on in Chicago, as well as the Python ecosystem across the board at Chicago Python. All this information plus more is going to be on our website, chippy.org. I also just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, I'm just wearing my uh, my Pi Texas, my Pi Texas uh, shirt from last year. Uh, this uh, conference was going to be happening last week, but it had to get canceled. I think actually moving it to, oh, sorry, I should say it had to get rescheduled, moved it to October, but still do want to give a shout out to that fantastic conference. Uh, that's actually where I met our uh, first speaker tonight. Speaking of which, bring the speakers on really quickly. So we got William Horton. He's going to be going up first about a brief history of Jupyter Notebooks. Next is going to be Haseeb Muhammad talking about six things that he learned as a software engineer trying out machine learning and positively won't believe number five. And then finally, we have Itai and his um, not webcam shared uh, talking about the alt here uh, visualization library. Uh, is that it for slides? Oh uh, yeah, just, uh, just going to get that going. Uh, so just want to make everybody aware uh, in our... YouTube chat, you can ask questions. There's gonna be a little bit of a delay. It's around like 20 seconds, I believe. So if you do have questions for our speakers, can you please ask them ahead of time and then we'll get them queued up. Also, our question for tonight is, what's your favorite Python data science tool? I know a lot of people come into Python data science because of pandas. Uh, some of them don't even know Python is the underlying language. They sort of just learn pandas and do their job that way, which is fantastic. Python lets you do that. We have also Dask in the ecosystem, uh, a big data tool like Spark. Do people like to get their hands dirty with some SQL and write uh, SQL alchemy core queries? Or do you prefer using good old fashioned Excel? Our last main meeting, we had a talk on how to move from Excel to Python. I don't know, sometimes Excel is the right tool. I would put my VBA skills against anybody. I think I could do pretty good. Uh, but that's enough about me and enough about Chippy. Let's bring on our first speaker. Welcome, William. How's it going? Welcome to Chicago Python. Thank you. Thank you. I always wanted to speak at Chippy. I didn't know that I'd be doing it like from my own apartment here in New York, but uh, it's, it's fun to be on. Yeah, well, I'm sure that's uh, not the most ideal situation, but yeah, we're excited to have you. Can you please introduce yourself to your, uh, to our audience? I know we met at a conference and know all about you, but let's tell your audience about us. Yeah, I, if you had told me we were going to wear the Pi Texas shirts, I would have matched with you. I've, I've got mine somewhere yeah. here. Um, yeah, my name's William. I work as a senior software engineer on the AI team at Compass. Uh, so Compass is a tech-enabled real estate brokerage, and so we're building tools that help real estate agents uh, improve their workflows as well as help consumers buy and sell homes. Um, before that, I worked at a startup here in New York called Blink Health. So that's kind of in the prescription drug space. Um, yeah, I've been uh, working with Python for probably about four or five years now. Um, awesome. Yeah. So how, how did you get into Python in the first place? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so my first job, I'm pretty sure I got it, I got it because I knew React which is funny because I have not touched React in many years, like probably three years. So I, I have no idea what's going on with React anymore. But um, my first job, I was working for this investment bank and we're building these applications to help the bankers workflow. So I was initially working on the web application, but uh, it was basically just the CTO and me building this stuff. So he's like, we need some work on the, on the data pipelines as well. Uh, and so that's when I started to learn Python uh, in my first job. And I uh, really liked the language and really liked working with data. So uh, kind of have gone progressively more in, in that direction as my career has gone on. 
Awesome. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I'm glad JavaScript's getting another shout out as it should. Fantastic <laughs> language. Um, but just to, to become a, just to step back a little bit, like we're all having to deal with sheltering in place, and it's been a bit difficult. Especially like we can't go hang out at conferences, can't really see our friends. How are you dealing with uh, COVID nineteen? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, I, I have to admit it has been tough on me. Uh, you know, I didn't expect to spend the last two months like indoors, um, but you know, some of the things I think I've been doing is uh, I have found more time to practice guitar. So, you know, maybe my neighbors might be annoyed with me by the end of quarantine. But, uh, you know, I, I have more time to spend on that, which has been nice uh, in the down times. And uh, I also just this week accomplished one of my quarantine goals, which is I've been trying to find a Nintendo Switch on sale because uh, those are mostly out of stock. So I got a Switch. Uh, so once I complete this talk, I, I think I'll have more time to spend on like Animal Crossing, which was my uh, big goal for the week besides this. <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking time away from Animal Crossing to talk about <laughs> Jupiter. <laughs> uh, I'm sure people can find you on the Nintendo Switch uh, like friend system. But yeah, uh, are you ready to get started with your talk? Really excited to hear about Jupiter. Uh, yeah, let me. And also, ahead. just want to make everybody aware those guitars in the background, they're actually not playable. They're just more of a decoration. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah i'm sharing my screen now so we awesome. can yeah. uh, we, go we ahead can and start yeah william horton please take it away cool um yeah so tonight i'm presenting a brief history of jupiter notebooks and i guess the inspiration for this talk was my observation that uh in some ways it seems like there's really two different worlds of python developers uh there's some python developers for whom writing Python looks like this. And there's other Python developers for whom writing Python looks something like this. Uh, and as someone who has found myself kind of with a foot in both worlds, I, I thought it would be interesting to try to dive into a little bit more about uh, this tool, the, the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, and you can also see that I've managed to follow the uh, standard convention of Jupyter Notebook naming uh, with that notebook called Untitled One. Um, so recognizing that there are two different uh, kind of worlds and maybe not everyone is so familiar with the Jupyter Notebook, I want to start off the talk just grounding us in and what I'm going to be talking about this, this tool. Uh, so I have this video of myself doing some things that you can do in a notebook. So you can execute Python code, um, a hello world, you can do basic addition. And the other interesting thing you can do with the notebook is you can also put in uh, markdown type cells. So that's another common feature. And so you can start to see that the notebook is useful not only for executing code, but also starting to put in text around the code. Uh, and that's obviously a, a big component of it. So this is a, a small snapshot of a Jupyter notebook just so that everyone is kind of on the same page about the tool we're going to be talking about. Uh, and you might ask, well, why? did I want to give this talk? Um, and so I'll give you a couple reasons that kind of inspired me to, to think about these topics. One is my own personal journey. Um, so the, when I started learning Python, I would only wrote Python scripts. So, you know, Python files. Um, I was working mostly on web application development, uh, but then I got really interested uh, in machine learning, mostly through the fast AI courses. And so then all my development uh, on that kind of stuff that I was learning was all in notebooks. Uh, and so, you know, for some amount of time, I was writing Python professionally, learning machine learning, writing notebooks 100% on the side. And so I obviously had some insight into the differences in these workflows and this notebook tool that was something I hadn't encountered maybe in my first year or, or year and a half of writing Python. Um, now in my job, I work on machine learning. I find myself with a little bit in both worlds, sometimes writing Python for web services, sometimes working with notebooks uh, that data scientists have written. Uh, and so that kind of inspired me to, to think more about this and, and want to dive in. Also, like a lot of things I do in programming, this is inspired by me uh, going through my Twitter feed one day, and I came up on this tweet by the founder of FastAI. And he said, I do think Mathematica doesn't get the credit it deserves for pioneering notebooks. 
Uh, and there's also this whole um, comment from the creator of Sage, which is another thing I'll talk about later in the talk. And so this also got me thinking, and I was like, I don't know where this tool came from at all. I don't know how we came to the point where people wanted to put code and text and visualizations all together. Uh, and so I, I thought it would be a cool thing to, to learn more about. And then probably the final reason is that Jupyter Notebooks are experiencing some amount of mainstream uh, popularity. You can see there is this article from 2018 from The Atlantic. There's also an article in Nature. Uh, and so there's this increased visibility. Um, Atlantic, The Atlantic even going so far to say the scientific paper is obsolete. And so in science, people are only going to be using these kinds of notebooks. Uh, and so uh, that is just one more reason I thought it would be uh, both interesting and timely to try to understand a little bit more about where this tool comes from. Uh, and so I've structured this talk into uh, three sections, basically past, present, and future. I'll spend most of the time talking about the past. So this is a brief history of Jupyter Notebooks. So understanding what were the projects that preceded it and, and what are some of the ideas that were uh, kind of in the air when this project came to be and, and where did it come from? I'll spend some time going over the present state and, and some projects that I think are, are pretty cool. And then I'll spend a little bit of time at the end speculating on what the future might be uh, and maybe some uh, interesting work that people are doing that hasn't uh, fully hit the mainstream. So I also want to start out by saying what this talk is not about, because um, I, I think it's important to establish that at the beginning. Um, so this isn't going to be about how to use Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so I gave a brief demo at the beginning just to give us kind of a common understanding of what the tool looks like, some of the things it can do. Um, but there are some good introductory materials online. There's this article from Real Python. Um, so if you if you search for that material, it's out there. And uh, I hope the talk maybe inspires you to even uh, want to look into this a little bit more if you haven't already. This is also not about loving or hating Jupyter Notebooks. Um, there's good material on that already. This is a pretty well-known talk uh, by Joel Gruss, um, where he went to JupyterCon and gave a talk called I Don't Like Notebooks, which is very entertaining. Uh, so if you, I would definitely encourage you to look up that talk, but that's not what this is going to be about. And then that spawned kind of a whole backlash and defense. And so there's, if you search the first notebook war, you're going to find some of these talks and blog posts that go into what's great about it, what sucks about it. Um, people talking about that. But that's not what I'm going to cover today. Today is uh, a more of a historical look at it. And, and like I said, trying to understand the origins of how we came to write code in this way, hopefully to give us a better understanding of the tools, the directions they may go in, and probably, hopefully also in, in light of some of these wars, a little more empathy for people both who choose to use these tools as well as those who, who choose not to. Um, so we'll start with the past. And we're, we're going to go back in time. I have to apologize to all the former science PhDs out there. I know that that is a common path into data science. And you may have even chosen that path to get away from some of these tools that I'm about to talk about. Um, but that's, that's just a heads up that you're going to see some of these interfaces that you may have been able to avoid uh, over the last couple of years. Um, so this goes back to this guy. Uh, and who's this guy? Um, people might know him as the guy who helped you with your math homework uh, through the Wolfram Alpha interface. So this is Stephen Wolfram. Uh, and the story that's going to lead us eventually to the Jupyter Notebook starts with Stephen Wolfram and Mathematica, which came out in 1988. Um, so Mathematica is kind of this all-in-one system. It has a language, which uh, is called Wolfram. Funny enough, uh, it's an execution environment. A lot of scientific and numerical libraries packaged into this system. Um, and also, uh, important for our story, a notebook interface, which was designed by this man, Theodore Gray. Uh, and Mathematica was very well received at the time. It won a Byte Award, um, the first annual Byte Awards. And it was, it was praised um, for helping uh, students with various mathematical and scientific tasks. The interesting thing about this uh, is I was able actually to go through this magazine, and I think I pulled out a couple of things that established kind of the time frame that we're in. Some of the other things that won 
the first annual Byte Awards. So we have Next Computer. Uh, and an interesting anecdote here is Steve Jobs is actually the one who convinced Wolfram to name the system Mathematica. Um, so that's a little tidbit. You might recognize this, maybe. This HP DeskJet printer, that was state of the art back in 1988. Uh, and also this book, the second edition of advanced MS-DOS programming. Um, so this is kind of the, the computing environment that we were in and Mathematica comes out. Um, so there's some key architectural details of the Mathematica notebooks um, that become important to the further development of these notebook interfaces. There's two parts to the system. Uh, so there's the kernel, which is gonna actually execute the code and return the results back, as well as a front end interface, which presents uh, what is the notebook. Um, another kind of interesting and important part uh, is the Mathematica notebook itself could be manipulated by Mathematica programs. Um, so there is that kind of element to it as well. So this was kind of the foundational ideas behind Mathematica notebooks when they came out. Um, and just to give you an idea of what it looked like back in 1988, and I actually found these in the Mathematica scrapbook when I was researching this talk, and it was fascinating to me. Um, so here's one example. Um, so you can see that uh, my math is very rusty, but this is doing some kind of series expansion. I also don't know Mathematica. So, but the interesting thing to me is just how the interface looks. Um, and it's kind of established this pattern that if you've used Jupyter Notebooks might actually look familiar to you, even though it's from like many decades ago. Um, so you have this code that executes in the input and the output is this expanded result. Uh, even more interesting, uh, is this visualization, which is really cool. So um, this is it actually doing a 3D plot and, and returning that output. Um, so these are things from, from way back in the day, but I think it's really cool to look at them and see how this same functionality kind of um, lives on even to the present. But actually the story doesn't really start with Mathematica in order to understand the ideas behind notebook interfaces, we have to go even further back um, to the guy who you might know as the author of books that everybody tells you they've read, but probably haven't actually read. Um, so this is Donald Knuth. He's done a lot of things in computer science. And one of the things that he did uh, that's maybe not as well known, at least not as well known as, as the books and as LaTeX uh, is these ideas of literate programming. Um, so he had this idea that we could write code and text together. Uh, and he implemented this in a system that he called web, which uh, maybe not the greatest name, you know what they say about kind of naming things. So he had this system called web. Um, and the idea was that these text and code snippets would be tangled together. Uh, and so you could be writing text and code and the text would help you understand the code and it would all flow together and then some of the benefits of the system is you could then pull out the text, for example, and weave that together into a kind of documentation. Um, but you'd also be able to execute the code snippets that were embedded in it. Um, and this is a really important idea. Um, it's kind of foundational to a lot of the work that happened later on notebook interfaces in the Jupyter Notebook. Um, so this is just an important thing to keep in mind is that literate programming is this idea that comes even further back uh, than when these interfaces like Mathematica started coming back, coming out. Um, so the next tool um, that we should talk about kind of in the progression of the notebook interface. Um, so Maple, uh, like Mathematica, was kind of this scientific computing environment as well as uh, its own programming language. Sorry about that. Um, and the first GUI for Maple came out in 1989. Um, so that's after Mathematica, and then in 1992, it came up with this worksheet interface, which again, um, kind of anticipates the, the familiar notebook interface. Um, so this is from the release notes. The user interface will support the concept of a worksheet, so you can integrate text, Maple input commands, Maple output, as well as graphics all in one. Um, so again, you can see how even, say back in the late 80s, early 90s, there are these ideas and, and these tools that are letting you do this kind of thing with code and text and visualization. 
Um, so here's kind of a picture of what the Maple interface looked like. Um, so you can see again, you can execute addition. You can also do these mathematical operations like factorization. Um, you can call into help and, and other things. And here's another example where you can actually do a 3D plot. And so this is an application that's running on your computer that lets you do this 3D plotting, but also includes the code that actually generated the plot. Um, so this is pretty cool stuff that was happening even in the 90s. And I think it's also interesting to look at the differences, say, between Mathematica and then Maple, which came out again a couple of years later. Uh, and I will say these are from a Maple document, but I think it's interesting because um, they kind of present them as clear advantages. But I think you can consider them just as, as trade-offs when you're designing this kind of system. So one thing Maple really uh, highlighted is it's using standard math notation. So on the left side, um, those look more like math expressions. The interesting thing is, to me, the Mathematica looks a lot more like kind of what programmers would write. Um, so you see things like the double equals, um, the function naming obviously looks a little bit more um, like, like an actual program. Um, so this is one of the differences that started to come out between these tools is saying um, the code to write the program versus the code that's supposed to look like actual math maybe that people would have in their papers. Um, so that's just one thing. Another thing that was interesting in Maple is that you can actually re-execute the, like, the stuff that's embedded in the text. Um, so you can see in this example here, you're, you've embedded a function, and it's evaluated it to find this discontinuity. But if you actually change the function, it will also update the like text statement uh, in this document. Uh, so I thought that was another pretty cool feature uh, of Maple. And this one, I think, is just an entertaining one um, that I found when I was digging into this. So uh, this is the enter versus shift enter. So Mathematica is is who you have to thank, maybe, if you're a person who does shift enter a lot in the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, but Maple was pushing very hard to say, this is a non-standard interaction that requires the users to adapt their normal behavior. Uh, although now, I think uh, most users of Notebooks are, are pretty familiar with it. But there was a downside to these tools, um, which is cost. So it costs a lot to license Mathematica. It costs a lot to license Maple. Uh, I mean, these are the current prices for personal licenses. But um, basically, people didn't necessarily want to pay for, for the use of these tools. And so this is where the history of the notebook uh, kind of coincides with the rise of open source. And this is also where we start to see it meeting with Python. Um, so in the early 2000s, there was really this confluence of several tools that came out that are going to spark a lot of the development that happened later. Um, so you have SciPy, um, which combined several kind of in-progress scientific numerical libraries for Python, um, then IPython. And this is IPython before the notebook. So there was later an IPython notebook. But this was IPython, uh, like the terminal and some of these features around parallel computation. Um, so the IPython was an improvement on the um, Python environment uh, even before they introduced the IPython notebook. And finally, Matplotlib. And this is an interesting anecdote. Uh, another thing I found um, when I was researching this talk is it was originally actually conceived as a patch to the IPython tool. So it was going to enable. Uh, plotting in IPython. Uh, but the creator of IPython, Fernando Perez, uh, did not have time to look at the patch. And so it became its own library, uh, a library that you know a lot of people still use today. Uh, so that was an interesting thing. But you can really look at the um, release of these three libraries, as well as uh, several other related ones, uh, as the growth of these open source scientific tools. Uh, and that's really going to push uh, toward like the development of later notebook interfaces uh, that we're going to talk about. So I did want to spend one slide talking about Fernando Perez, uh, because the story of the Jupyter Notebook cannot be told without him. He is someone who is largely responsible for it. Uh, so he started, he created IPython in 2001 as a graduate student. Uh, he's currently an associate professor at Berkeley, as well as a co-founder and senior fellow at the Berkeley Institute for Data Science. 
uh, still doing a lot of work on Python and Python tooling. Uh, and he's also received several awards for his work on this software. Um, so he's someone who really drove uh, the development of the IPython notebook and Jupyter notebook later uh, forward. So with the development of these open source Python tools, um, I think people started to think, how can we actually use these libraries also in an environment that gives us the benefits of something like Mathematica or Maple? Uh, and so that's when Sage or Sage Math came out in 2005. Um, so this was an open source software system. Uh, and you can see it right in the documentation. They say a viable open source alternative to Magma, Maple, Mathematica, and MATLAB. So it's integrating these open source Python tools into a, an execution environment and uh, a web-based notebook. Uh, so this was created by William Stein uh, and it was implemented in Python and Cython. And like I said, importantly, it was released with an open source license. Uh, so this is a really big step in the development of notebooks and in their increased adoption. Um, so it was kind of hard to find some examples of the interface because you can actually now execute Sage kernels in Jupyter. So there's kind of been a confluence there. Um, but this is from a tutorial circa 2012 that gives you some idea of what the Sage notebook or and the files are called worksheets. Um, this is kind of what it looked like back then, at least. Um, and you can see it can also do basic, you know, code execution and math. The very interesting thing to me that Sage had that you don't necessarily even see in tools today is it actually embedded word editing into the notebook. So you can see this. This is like a full-featured word editor in the Sage notebook system, uh, which I think is pretty cool and maybe something that actually could be done in Jupyter today, or may maybe someone's developed the package and I just haven't seen it. But if not, uh, that's a open source opportunity there. The other thing I saw in the Sage documentation I just wanted to highlight is the shift enter continued to be the, the dominant mode and uh, Maple wanting to just let users hit enter, that never really caught on. So that's why you're stuck with shift enter, shift enter, all the way through your notebook. So finally, we got to what is the precursor to the Jupyter Notebook, the IPython Notebook. Um, again, it's actually kind of hard to find documentation about this because eventually it became Jupyter. Uh, but you can see at the time it was embedded into IPython. So you ran an IPython Notebook, it would open up the interface. Um, and this is from some of the old documentation. And you can see even when it was just IPython Notebook, it had these main components. Uh, so the web application that would let you combine text and math and code and visualization, as well as the notebook documents that would actually hold on to the information that you've created. And so finally, Project Jupyter. And before I fill in some details here, I want to tell you something that absolutely blew my mind when I found it out, which is why is it called Jupyter? It's because originally it supported Julia and Python and R, so Jupyter. Uh, and I, I found that out when I was working on this talk, and I thought it was absolutely uh, amazing. So that's kind of where Jupyter comes in. Uh, it's kind of a spin-off of IPython uh, and the IPython notebook. Um, basically, the notebook interface, as well as language agnostic parts of IPython. And again, this was formed by Fernando Perez, who had originally uh, created IPython to focus on developing the notebook and um, other parts outside of IPython. So that brings us all the way up to the present. Uh, so I'm going to spend some time going over, I think, projects that are, are pretty well adopted in the Jupyter e ecosystem today. There's obviously the Jupyter Notebook, uh, tried and true. People love it or hate it. Um, so we have the Jupyter Notebook. Also, more recent, Jupyter Lab. Um, so this is the so-called the next generation notebook interface. Uh, it integrates more kind of IDE type features as opposed to kind of just your standard notebook. Um, so this is something that uh, has come out and is starting to gain popularity as well. Uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. You can see the main notebooks in the middle, but it also gives you um, the file system on the left and some of these other tabs and things that make it look a little bit more like IDEs. Voila. So this is another cool thing, basically a way to turn the Jupyter Notebook into a web application. 
So basically you can create interactive widgets in the notebook and that hide some of the cells. And so this is one example from their documentation. Basically, um, you can create these sliders in a Jupyter notebook and then deploy it. Um, so that's another thing that's, that's uh, kind of become popular. Binder kind of goes along with that. So Binder is an easy way to actually deploy uh, interactive notebooks. So you need to take a Git repo, uh, give it the name of the repo, and then Binder will actually open this up in an environment that lets you execute it. Um, so this is another tool that has become very useful in the, in the Jupyter ecosystem. The other big thing that characterizes um, kind of the current state of Jupyter, there are now dozens of languages supported. So kind of when it broke off from IPython, um, there was the IPython kernel and there was Jupyter and maybe Julia and R support as well, kind of the main languages of data science. Um, but now there's dozens of languages supported. There's a, there's a huge list you can see in this logo. Um, JavaScript is on there. So another shout out to the JavaScript, PHP, um, F Sharp. And it's actually interesting to me, I went through this list and there's actually some tools that even came up earlier in the history of the, the notebook interface that now you can actually run through Jupyter. Um, so SageMath, you can execute, um, as well as actually the Wolfram language for Jupyter, which is a way to let you run Wolfram in uh, Jupyter. So the lame, same language you would use in Mathematica. Um, so that's a big part of Jupyter today, I think, is just this increased um, access to different languages. Another thing that's really, I think, quite popular, especially among people doing machine learning is Google Colab. So this is a notebook interface that Google hosts, um, has access to Google Drive, uh, it has access to GPUs and TPUs. And so this has become a very popular way to uh, share code and execute code in the browser. Another thing that's really useful is support in GitHub for rendering notebooks. Um, so because it's a lot better to review that than this. So uh, GitHub has support for looking at notebooks and that's just a really nice thing in a lot of people's workflow. Um, so those are kind of some things that I would say are nice about the present ecosystem. So finally, I'm going to take the opportunity to speculate a little bit about the future, at least based on trends that I'm aware of. So the first thing I think is interesting is kind of a converging um, of Jupyter and IDEs. So I talked about Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Lab 2.0 actually came out in April of 2020. It adds a lot more features, including the Jupyter Lab language server protocol, um, which will help support a lot of um, IDE like features as well as a debugger. Um, so you could use PDB before, but this is a more integrated debugger for Jupyter Lab. At the same time, if you look at re recent releases of VS Code, they're improving native support for Jupyter notebooks. So at the same time, Jupyter interface is trying to add more IDE-like features. VS Code is trying to add better support for Jupyter. And so I think in the future, this is something that will just continue is people don't necessarily want to choose one or the other. Uh, sometimes they want both, or at least the advantages of both. And so I think you're just going to see an increased convergence there. The other thing, and I talked about Colab, is hosted solutions or notebooks as an interface to compute. Um, so this is not a new concept. I mean, you've had Databricks notebooks and, and other notebooks, but I think it's just something you're gonna see more and more of, especially as people start to use more specialized devices for their workflows. So like I said, Colab can connect you to GPUs and TPUs. SageMaker, which is Amazon's ML service, has also become very popular purely for letting you easily set up hosted notebooks that can connect to GPUs. Um, so that's a big feature of SageMaker. And then Kaggle as well uh, allows you to run notebooks that connect to GPUs and TPUs and also already have access to the data on their competition platform. Um, so increasingly, I think notebooks also become just an interface for running the code that I write on my computer on a computer that is very far away. Uh, it becomes a very easy way to do that. And I think you're only going to see more of that as, as time progresses. The other really interesting thing um, that people are working on is real-time collaboration. So 
if the notebook is increasingly the tool of the data scientists, uh, how do we actually let people collaborate on them? Um, and so there's this left side is from a startup called Deep Note, and so they're creating a Jupyter compatible notebook that allows you to do real time collaboration. Uh, and on the right is from the documentation of CoCalc. Um, so that was actually created by William Stein, who created Sage. Uh, and so he's now working on this platform that can allow you to do uh, live collaborative editing and chatting. So a kind of Google Docs like um, experience for the Jupyter Notebook. And I, I think that's something that if someone gets this right, it's going to be absolutely incredible. And I think really uh, things will take off from there if someone can really crack how to get this working. And the last thing, which is something I experience in my work like frequently, is just how to review the notebook and work with Git. And so there's a lot of tools coming out around this. I don't think there's necessarily one that's totally cornered the market. So FastAI has this set of tools called NB Dev that they've uh, used to create their library. I think they're incredibly useful if you want to take notebook code and start to turn it into uh, modules and libraries that you can publish and other people can use. It has a lot of great things for that kind of workflow. Um, Review NB is another tool. Um, so you can see a screenshot where it helps. GitHub can render the notebooks, but it still is very bad at diffing. So Review NB is a tool that helps you diff them. Uh, and then these are things that literally just came out today. As I was working on this presentation, had to add some slides. Um, so this is GitHub Code Spaces, which will let you edit Jupyter Notebooks directly on GitHub. So I haven't even had time to play with this myself, but it was coming out today. It looks super cool. And then I thought that was the last thing I'd have to add. And then this came out at 5.49 PM. And it said, automatically drop links to a Jupyter Notebook with the right dependencies in your PRs with a simple actions workflow. And this is powered by Binder, the, the tool that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so I think these are really cool things um, that are just going to improve the review and kind of working with notebooks in Git or some kind of version control system. Um, that really still has a lot of pain points. And so I think tooling around this is really going to be uh, a really big future direction for notebooks. So that concludes my talk. Um, but I did want to say, I love notebooks, um, but you don't have to love them. I hope at least this talk showed you a little bit about where they came from. They're not just some idea people came up with in the last couple of years to torment software engineers. Um, there really is a rich history behind these tools and the way people use them. And I think there's a lot to be learned uh, from looking at where these came from and also looking into what, what features they might support in the future. So thank you so much for, for having me. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take some, some questions from the chat. Awesome, thanks so much, William. Everybody, can we please give William a round of applause in the chat? I just threw mine in there. I really like the idea of like learning from software history because a lot of this is context and like knowing about it explains a lot of decisions. Like the shift enter, that's fascinating. I love that. <laughs> Uh, so while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, I do have a couple of questions. Like, what is your workflow with Jupyter Notebooks? Like, I know people use them in many different ways, but do you have like a, a workflow that works for you? Yeah, um, I guess I'll talk about two workflows. Like, um, I'll talk about what I do for say like Kaggle competitions, which is I just use work like I just use notebooks, like all the way through. It's just notebooks. I make copies of the notebooks. I edit them. I would not say it's an efficient workflow, but for something like that, like you're trying out a lot of things. Um, so I just kind of work in the notebooks and, uh, but there there are some downsides to that. Like I will say, so, sorry, I need to go to drink of water. Um, at work though, I mean, we're working on this because we, we have uh, engineers as well as scientists. So um, a lot of the times it comes down to Maybe the maybe the data scientist has done an exploratory work in a notebook, and often what I find myself having to do is like pull those parts out, turn them into a Python module that we can actually use, say in like a service or or in like a a consumer process. So at work, a lot of the times it's figuring out, okay, how do we take this notebook code and then factor out the parts of it into a Python file. Um, so that's to say, I don't think I've totally solved it. Like, you know, um, but 
But I think at least for now, maybe in like a professional setting, often the end goal is always going to be like Python files with, with some exceptions. Like um, Netflix has some tools like Paper Mill, uh, which I wanted to include. I, I don't think I had time to throw that slide in there, but um, they basically just execute notebooks as their workflows. So it's like they can parameterize notebooks. I, I actually, I got to sprint on this at PyCon last year and it was very fun. So um, So some people do it, but I think right now, a lot of time the workflow is going to be experimentation and interaction in a Jupyter notebook. And at some point, I think you're going to have an engineer turn it into Python code that you're going to run. Yeah, awesome. That makes a lot of sense. Like, uh, like productionizing things is just a really difficult concept to begin with. Uh, our, actually, our next question comes from Joe Jasinski. And Joe actually had a presentation or a, a tutorial at PyCon a couple of years ago on using Docker for data science. So putting it behind, like putting an API behind your model or something like that. And so that's like one way of doing it. But for this question, Joe's wondering, how do you distribute notebooks? Uh, or yeah, let's start with that one. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um... I mean, I can tell you what my team does. Like sometimes we check them in to Git. Um, so like I said, there's some friction around the review process, but at least like then you know the file is checked in is the one like that you can get and run. Um, but it's also, I guess the interesting thing there is like there's always like dead notebooks and there's live notebooks. Like the notebook you commit is just a JSON representation of the notebook that was run. Whereas really what you probably want is to actually like open up the notebook, which is why something like Binder um, becomes popular. I'll also say like one thing we're doing is having like some some kind of centralized Jupyter server. So in our case, we use Kubeflow um, for machine learning infrastructure. So if you enable people to host Jupyter servers, then sharing the notebook can also just become like sending the link. So like I have access to our Jupyter server, you have access to our Jupyter server. We can send those links around and collaborate um, you still run into the problems of things like getting out of sync. So maybe you sent me the link to your notebook yesterday. I wanted to adapt it. And you also did work on it today. Um, so like I said, those things I don't think are even solved. There's just like different workarounds that we're using and that other people are using. But um, it, it's a really good question. I wish I had a good answer for it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just uh, as the space evolves, like better answers come about, better tools come about. Like I remember just a few years ago, like notebook diffing was so difficult, and now it's like sort of like feasible as like sort a of okay. Yeah, yeah, it's not that bad. And so Joe also had a second question: Are do you know of any alternatives to uh, to binders? Uh, I'm I'm not that familiar with the alternatives, so. Uh... Unfortunately, I can't help you with that one. Okay, cool. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what are some useful Jupyter extensions, and preferably if they're extensions for data scientists? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, I I think like some of the ones I mentioned in uh, Jupyter Lab 2.0. Well, I guess you met you asked for data scientists, but I I'm excited about some of the language server features. Like I think it's gonna be really cool. Um, cause that's one thing I miss. Like I work a lot in IntelliJ when I'm actually writing code and, um, a lot of the things you get from working in code there up to this point, haven't been supported. So I, I personally am very excited about some of those things. Um, the other things I think for data scientists, um, one that I'm aware of that I also think is super cool is you can actually monitor like GPU usage. Um, so this is something that's come out of NVIDIA. Whereas you're running your notebook, you can also uh, have this extension that's kind of visualizing um, how saturated the GPU becomes. And so that can be a really useful uh, part of the workflow if you're doing anything on GPU, which is a, a lot of it these days. Um, yeah. So yeah, those are, those are some things at least that I've seen that I think are, are pretty cool. Awesome. And just a shout out uh, for our audience to check out, William has been giving, uh, he gave a talk on GPUs. So if you search William Horton on YouTube, you will find that talk. I highly recommend it. Uh, we have a question coming in from Derek. Oh, would you ever want to write a PDF book or an ebook with Jupyter? Has somebody done that yet? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's another thing that I, I kind of cut out of the talk for, for time reasons, but um, there is, there are a couple libraries. The big one is Jupyter Book. So if that's something you're interested in, I would check it out. Um, and then FastAI's book was also completely generated out of Jupyter Notebooks. And they have a very interesting system that they've written for kind of pulling out 
and, and annotating different sections that are meant to be rendered in different ways. Um, so I think it's there right now. And I, I think I've seen like really good results from the people who are using these things. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question. It's a really cool use case. And, and I think the tooling is out there right now. Yeah, every time I see what fast AI does with like notebooks, I get a little scared. I'm like, have they gone too far? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of people ask that, but um, you know. It's like you're serving like a blog from a notebook. That's like a little bit crazy, but it's also amazing that you can do that. Yeah, I think one thing I really like admire from them is they have a philosophy, they get the tools to work for them, right? So, uh, you know, some people criticize them for it, but I, I think Jeremy and the other collaborators like, they're using Python and Jupyter to enable their workflows, right? They, they're not necessarily so concerned about what is Pythonic or how you should use notebooks. And I respect that a lot. And I mean, I've learned a lot from them, even if like I wouldn't necessarily do everything that they're doing with notebooks, I, I think it's so, super cool. Yeah, software is about shipping and you got to respect how much they ship. Uh, we got a question from the chat. Do you know of a good uh, tool for word correction in a notebook? Like maybe like a spell check or a grammar check? I'm not really aware of that. Sorry. Cool. That's okay. I'm sure there's something. If, I know Jupyter, if you go to their website, they have a huge list of plugins. So that's definitely an, uh, an avenue people can find to get uh, things that they're looking for. Uh, before uh, we let you go, do you have any call to actions for our community? Ooh, I, I didn't know I was going to be asked for that. <laughs> oh, sorry to put you on the spot. Besides uh, play uh, animal, is it animal plant? What is it? Animal. <laughs> I don't yeah, even know this. Play Animal Crossing. Animal Crossing, yeah. Play more Animal Crossing. Um, yeah, just uh, just have fun. I think like you know, being quarantined is some opportunity to learn new things, and it doesn't have to be technical things, right? So you know, it's it's fun to to learn about some of this stuff and write code, and I spend some of my personal time on that. But uh, it's just a good time to to spend on whatever makes you happy. I think that's really key. That's solid advice. Focus on <laughs> yourself. That's where happiness comes from. Well, William, it was great having you on. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, so we're going to be taking a little bit of a break. And then after, we're going to have Haseeb talking about what he's been learning about machine learning. And you won't believe number five. See you in a bit.
Hey everybody, welcome back to the Chicago Python Data Sig presents Data Tools live stream. That's a really long intro. We should probably change that. All right, I'm gonna to get to work on that after. I uh, do want to just uh, thank William Horton for uh, speaking about uh, giving us a history of Jupyter Notebooks. Had a call out in the comments during the break, a great Jupyter Lab uh, plugin, or sorry, Jup yeah, Jupyter Lab plugin is Jupyter Code Formatter. So uh, check that out, format your code. Linting is always a lot of fun. Also, we did have our question for the night. Let me just get that going. So we asked everybody, what is your favorite Python data science tool? I mean, Python is used a lot of places, but it feels like data science is taking up a majority of those jobs and uses of Python now. So um, people have a lot of tools that they like. So we got Pablo say he likes pandas. Constantine, for sure, it's pandas. Like, is there any doubt? Joe's jumping in with some love for PySpark. Uh, Zach is talking about NumPy. Of course, it underlies it. Without NumPy, there is really no Python data science. Uh, but yeah, let us know what is your favorite Python data science tool. We're really interested to know. I would still say mine is Excel. I also like to write a little bit of SQL Alchemy. Uh, so next up, we have Haseeb Muhammad. Welcome to the stream, Haseeb. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Sure. My name is Haseeb Muhammad. I'm a senior software engineer at Polaris Solutions. I specialize in cloud development and machine learning. Polaris Solutions is a software engineering firm and we provide modern software projects for our customers and clients. Awesome. So uh, how, do, how long have you been coding in Python? How did you first get into it? So I got into Python in the last two years. I started my master's at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology in computer science, specializing in machine learning. And almost all the classes there are in Python. So I started at an academic level. Otherwise, I've been a software engineer, C Sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript for the last eight years. So Python is new for me in the last few years. Yeah, awesome. Love another shout out for JavaScript. I feel like we might have to turn into a JavaScript meetup soon enough. Also, uh, just to get a little bit more serious, like it is hard for all of us. We're sheltering in place. How have you been handling uh, the lockdown? I've been keeping busy. So the classes are roughly 20, 25 hours a week of effort. Um, so right after work, it's jump right into classes and I can lose my entire day just studying. So this summer, I'm taking the summer off, but I am planning to do my Azure Data Scientist certification. So that's good, maybe 40 hours of study that I'm looking forward to in the next, next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's always good to uh, sort of just get those goals crossed off. But you, it sounds like you were studying and uh, working while you're working full time. Yes. So can you talk uh, about some of the challenges? Because I know a lot of our viewers are thinking about maybe making a jump to doing a master's program. Can you talk about like your experiences? So I've been enrolled since for about two years now. I'm taking one course at a time. There was only one semester where I ever tried to do two courses and full-time job and family, and that never works. I had zero free time to sleep. It, it was just chaos. But one class at a time, as long as you set aside time for when you're going to study, and maybe give one day out of your weekend up and maybe sleep just like an hour or two less, it's totally possible. Both of my older brothers, they're doing MBAs. One just finished his MBA. They're already doctors and now they're doing MBAs on top of it. So I just saw them, they were doing it. I was like, okay, cool. I can do something as well. Yeah. That's awesome. It's just like, yeah, you got to make the effort, the determination and you can definitely do anything. So if people are looking to make a switch, you definitely have it in you. And Good luck with that uh, with that decision. Georgia also, Tech is really cheap on top of that. Yeah, Georgia I've Tech. heard it's like 8,000 for like the whole degree. Yeah, so you're not breaking the bank. You're, you're yeah, fine. Yeah, that's fantastic. Awesome. Oh, would it be okay if people have questions that they could reach out to you on our Slack? I know you just recently joined. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You can awesome, email on Slack or you can email me. I'll drop my email in the Slack as well. Awesome, thank you so much for making yourself available for these kinds of questions. Uh, are you ready to get started with your talk? Yes, I am. And awesome. I'm going to start with Menti. So you guys may or may not know what Menti is, but I would like you to go to menti.com and enter this code. So you can use your phone. You go to menti.com and you'll enter in 889407. 
Now I'm going to see how many people are joining in the bottom right corner. So my first question to all the viewers is, what is your understanding of machine learning? I just want to get an idea of what you folks know, and I want to compare. So we have some answers on here. Um, I know of it, trying to learn more. I'm a noob. I've made some progress, or it's I, what I get paid to do. If there's any issues, yay. So for me personally, I wrote that I, I'm somewhere in between. I've made some progress, and it's what I get paid to do. I'm hoping by the time I finish my master's, it'll be a full-time thing, getting some more bubbles popping up. And Ali, what is your answer to this? Oh uh, yeah, sure. My answer was like I was a math major in undergrad, but that's a long time ago. So it's it's something I do know about, but I'm definitely interested in learning more. That's awesome. So but I I also want to say I really like this interactivity. It's fantastic. I love Menti. It's like if you ever seen uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? This is just ask your audience. So this is the lifeline. I like getting interactive with the audience just to get them, you know, engaged. Fantastic. So this is my first question. My last question, I'm going to skip to it. Sorry, folks, if you didn't get the answer, is do you use version control? So yes, no, and I save files differently to differently labeled folders on my desktop. I am guilty of the third. Ali, I don't know about yourself. I am. I try to follow software engineering best practices. I even try to do like CI pipelines for my side projects. It's a little bit too much. So when I was starting with Python, when I was starting with any kind of exploratory data analysis, I'd start with the notebook and I just have all these different ways that I was attacking it and I just keep saving things to different files on my desktop. So it's really great to see that there are a good amount of folks using version control. So I've started doing that with my Python stuff and I'll be going into that in just a minute. Awesome. Thank you so much folks for sharing your answers. You should be seeing my slides now. Yeah, please take it away. Do uh, you mind clicking the hide for the stop sharing? Yeah. Nope. Won't let me get to it. Okay, don't worry about it. We're all good. Haseeb, please take it away. So my name is Haseeb Mohammed. I'm gonna be sharing with you six tips for any technologist getting started with machine learning might wanna know. A little about myself, I'm a senior software engineer. I specialize in cloud development and machine learning at Polaris Solutions. We specialize in modern software projects for our customers. Currently earning my master's in computer science at Georgia Institute of Technology, specializing in machine learning. You can find me on LinkedIn, Baba Brown Bear, or you can email me, haseeb at polaris.llc. So I got to ask the audience, and it looks like there's a good amount of knowledge here, when folks ask me what is machine learning, my go-to answer is if traditional programming is taking rules and data to get results, then machine learning is taking those, taking that data and its results to get a set of rules. So for instance, if you're approving a loan at a bank, traditional programming might have what is your income, uh, how old are you, how long have you had a job, and it'll take all those if then branches and come up with, okay, we'll approve you for a loan. With machine learning, what you could do is take a data set of labeled uh, approved loans and denied loans, run that through a model, and you'll get back a model that will tell you whether or not a person should be approved or denied with some percentage of probability. So that's my go-to answer for what is machine learning. First thing I wanna share with you guys is Thankfully, William covered it. Jupyter Notebooks are awesome, but VS Code takes it to another level. So what I found the least amount of friction to get started with Jupyter Notebooks is Google Colab. Just pop it open, log in with your Gmail account, and you have a notebook ready to go. But we can take that a step further with VS Code. So here's VS Code. I'm hoping a lot of you folks know this already. I'm gonna just zoom in a little bit on each of the sides. On the left, we have our list of files. And in the middle, we have the Python file that we're actually running. At the very bottom is our integrated terminal where I can run the actual script file that I'm writing at the same time. And I can see the output. For instance, here, I'm doing a, a dot head to show the top five results of my data frame. 
What's awesome about VS Code is that there is an integrated Jupyter notebook where I can shift enter some amount of code and it'll bring it over to the, this right terminal and show Jupyter notebook cells executed. And I can continue my any kind of exploratory data analysis on this right side. What I can do then is if I write up anything of significance, I can just copy that code into my Python file and then I can commit that Python file into version control. That way I can keep all my toying and exploring in Jupyter notebooks, not have to worry about it. And then anything I wanna keep, just drop it in a Python file and commit it. So that's my workflow. That way my diffs look clean. I know William brought that up and it's, for me, it's cleaner to, to do this. So number two, scientists keep an experiment log so do chefs and so should we. So with this quarantine, I've been watching too many cooking shows on YouTube and what some chefs will do is they'll, they'll start with, oh, I used to do this recipe with just this much salt or I tried brown sugar, or I tried dark sugar and it came out this way. What they'll do is they'll write down in their notebook all the different types of recipes that they tried and the results of them. So that they know, oh, last time I used too much salt, I need to adjust it so I can get a better recipe this time. The code I'm gonna be walking through here is on dev.2. You can Google Bobber Brown Bear making money with ML. And what I'm gonna be showing you is the Azure ML VS Code extension. So the Azure ML VS Code extension and the Python SDK that they provide gives you access to a function called run.log. Now what run.log does is it'll output the value of that parameter into a dashboard on Azure ML. So for instance, I'm outputting all these different parameters for a model that I'm running below in this file. And I wanna see the output of this file on Azure ML. So these are all the parameters for the model. And then this is what I'm using to gauge the success of my model. So at the very end of my file, I'm saying, how much money did this model actually make? What I can do with this file is I can then run it as an experiment in Azure with that extension. And then what I can do further is I can continue to tweak each parameter and repeat the last run. And I'll keep running the same thing as the same experiment in Azure and I'll get to see the output of different runs. I won't need to use my local. I can just say, queue up 10 of these different uh, parameter changes and I can run it on it and see the results in Azure ML. So this is Azure ML. This is the dashboard for the experiment that I was running. At the bottom, you'll see two runs, run two and run three. Run two made $9,300, run three made $13,000. Uh, $13, and I can see the difference between the two runs is the number of estimators that I used. So between run two and three, I added an, 100 and estimators. Now I know, okay, let me continue to increase those estimators till I get to a point where I'm not making any more money and then I can start with the other parameters as well to see if I can keep tweaking that to get a better result. And I can get all this clean output on the dashboard for Azure ML. Number three, the GPU on my MacBook Pro cannot run PyTorch. What I wanted to do this year was learn deep learning. And I had thought that my very nice MacBook Pro, I could run the PyTorch uh, on it and I'll have faster execution by using the GPU. That's not the case. PyTorch has a accessibility matrix for what GPUs can and cannot run on it, and mine was not compatible. So what I did instead was use Google Colab and switch the notebook settings to use a GPU. And that's how I ran most of my deep learning stuff that I did this year. What you can do instead, so again, this is for a notebook, but when I'm running for, when I'm running Python files and I wanna run it, uh, I will use Azure ML's remote compute instances. So on Azure ML, I can create a remote run, a remote compute instance, and I can set it to a GPU. So over here, I'm generating a GPU with 12 cores, two GPUs, a whole lot of RAM, and a whole lot of disk space. Now I can write my, my models in a regular Python script and then send it up to Azure ML to run remotely, and I won't need to use the CPU on my MacBook and not let it overheat. Number four, moving data between scripts doesn't need to be in CSVs. So I have a software engineering background. I like a lot of separation of concern. 
when I'm writing my Python files, I'll write one for cleaning my data, one for running the training model, one for running the validation script, and then one for any kind of visualizations. What I was doing was wrong. What I was doing was saving my data as CSVs and importing and exporting between each of the files. What I had to do then as well was trim down the number of decimals that I was writing to. Instead, I started using pickles this year and it saves your data frame as a physical file on your data system. And you can just import that pickle and you'll have access to that variable in your script without, uh, without losing any accuracy. So over here, there's some sample code from uh, pandas on how to create a pickle and then how to read the pickle in a new file. So then once I started using that between my files, instead of saving as a CSV, I saw a much better increase in precision and accuracy. Number five. All right, so I've been running a model. I've been tweaking this. I maybe have run a dozen different kinds of parameters on my model and it's still not giving me the results I want. Maybe 13,000 is not the amount of money that I wanna do. Maybe I wanna get to 100,000. But now I have to start all this over again with a new model. That's time consuming and I don't have a lot of time. So what I'm proposing to you instead is automate the initial model finding. If you have your clean data set, just use Azure ML's automated ML, select the target column you're attempting to predict, select your remote compute instance, and just let it go. What it's gonna do is it's gonna run dozens, if not hundreds of different models and try to come up with an accuracy for you, the best possible accuracy. So this is just the top seven, eight runs of a model I did. It ended up doing about 50 runs. And it found that a voting ensemble for my data set would give the most accuracy. Just on these seven runs alone, it jumped from 65% to 83%. Now this is, this model, I would say you take it and then you tweak it further and try to get that 83% up even higher by just playing with the different parameters of that model. Number six, don't be afraid of failure. The only reason I'm here is because I made thousands of mistakes and you learn from them. You just be consistent, you just keep learning and it's okay to fail. That's the only way you are going to learn. I'm happy to chat more. Go ahead and email me, Hasib at Polaris LLC. I'll also be in the Slack if you wanna hit me up over there. Thank you so much. Awesome, can we get a round of applause for uh, Hasib and that awesome talk? Uh, so while we are waiting for questions to come in, I think we actually have one question. Uh, I'm not too sure if you're familiar with the ML flow tool. Is Azure ML like ML flow? I have not used an ML flow tool, but if I understand you correctly, you can use that to get your models into production. So you can write a model, it'll save it and output it, and you can create it as an API endpoint on Azure ML. Okay, awesome. And uh, just uh, to uh, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll call out back to our discussion question of the night. Do you have like a favorite like data science tool that you can like recommend to people? So um, I've been using Pandas since I started, but I have a place in my heart for just SQL. Like I've been using SQL ever since I graduated uh, with my bachelor's and my entire professional career is just using SQL. If I can get anything to a relational database model, I'll use it that way. So when I first started Python and Pandas, I didn't understand pandas. I didn't understand what was going on in the data frame. So I just took my data set, imported it into SQL, did whatever I wanted to do, outputted it back out. And then I ran my Python script because I was like, I don't have time to learn pandas. I already know what I have to do in SQL. Let's just do that. But since then I've grown and I've, I've learned to use pandas a bit more. Yeah, pandas is a fantastic tool, but I think like SQL, you can use it for anything. It's like pretty much any problem could be solved with the relational database. And just knowing a little bit about that, like can, like put you so far ahead as a data scientist. Do you have any tips or like, or like any tips on learning SQL? Oh, uh, sqlbolt.com. That's my go-to resource for whenever someone says, hey, I want to learn SQL. I did not write it. I'm not associated with them, but I've been um, pitching that to anyone who wants to learn SQL. I'll drop that link in the Slack. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that would be great. I was looking for, yeah, we just got a question. And so, uh, do you know about like the the cost prohibitiveness of like Azure ML versus like Absolutely. training models on a desktop? So I've been I maybe ran five hundred models on Azure ML so far, and I spent five dollars. 
I've run deep learning models. I've run regular machine learning models. It doesn't break the bank and they give you $150 credit when you sign up. They, they want to get people onto the system. So it's really cheap to use, especially right now. And you can get access to credits almost always. Awesome. And we are not sponsored right now, but uh, Microsoft, if you are <laughs> listening, we are open for video <laughs> sponsorship. Uh, thanks again, Haseeb. Uh, before we let you go, do you have any call to actions for our community? No call to action, but any questions, please email me. I'm happy to chat. Awesome. And thank you so much for making yourself available to our community. And I uh, hope to see you again on the Slack. Thanks. Have a good one. All right. So next up, we're going to have our third speaker. Rich is just going to jump right into it. Uh, so welcome to the stream, uh, Itai. Hi, everybody. Itai is a chippy member. He's been coming to meetings forever. He's been speaking, and we're very excited to have you on. Uh, Itai, for those of you, us who do not know you, can you please introduce yourself to our uh, live stream audience? Yeah, so uh, for 15 years, I traded uh, equity options. I was a specialist, and uh, I was a market maker and then a specialist, and then I did some clerking on the CME. And then um, I also owned a... Uh, black box trading shop uh, with three other partners. And uh, what I'll be talking about is actually a trade that we used to do about six years ago and that I had heard about 10 years ago. And um, sort of, I was talking to a friend a couple months ago and uh, we wanted to see if it still exists basically because it's a very interesting sort of phenomenon that happens in the marketplace. Awesome. Can't wait to get into it. But yeah, can you talk a little bit about uh, how did you first get into Python? Um, I wanted to build my, I had an idea for a game generator and uh, I didn't know, I, well, I knew VBA and I, and I worked a lot, a lot in MATLAB uh, when I had the firm, but um, I didn't know any other languages and sort of people prepare data for me and uh, not prepare the data, but they would like prepare the the tools for me to use to pump in data. And, uh, and so when I got the game, when I wanted to make my game generator, I was like, I need to learn a language. And I just picked Python. Basically. That was it. Just I mean, you can't go wrong with Python. It's the second best language for everything. I believe that's what they say. Yeah. But yeah, just uh, changing gears a little bit, uh, we're all having to deal with uh, sheltering in place. It's been a little bit more difficult, but I will say these chippy live streams are actually helping me out. Like I look forward to every single one of these and I'm so excited for everyone. But how have you been dealing with uh, with this COVID-19? Um, I've been learning a lot. I've been taking on extra projects like this uh, visualizing stuff, <laughs> this project right now. Um, yeah, just a lot of learning, a lot of videos uh, and tutorials, and um, it's been okay. You know, it's it's. I think it's yeah. good. I think a lot of amazing. I think a lot of amazing software, and art, and just really neat things will eventually um, come out of this sort of regime. So. Yeah, it's like it's like a shared experience we're all a part of, and yeah, I can't wait to sort of see the uh, the artistic side and how that comes out. There's definitely a rise in podcasts. I think everybody has like I feel like like my mic. I'm sure you can tell. Like, it's like my setup gets more upgraded every single time. So like that's how I'm really spending a lot of my time. Uh, yeah. So are you ready to get started? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm ready. Um, Do you want to share uh, your screen? We'll just get it up. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Let me just. Uh... Uh, you guys can see it. Is that what? That's that's a person. That's a screen. There yeah. we go. All right. Okay. Uh, just one second. Um, just give me one. One. Yeah. Take your time. And also, just uh, people are giving you a couple of shout outs from uh, from Kevin and from Zach. All right. I'm back. All right. All right. So uh, today we're going to talk away. about uh, visualing visualizing the Toronto Stock Exchange and uh, its market on closed facility. Uh, with Altair. So, uh, yeah, so we'll, let's just... so where's Altair? Altair is a visual, uh, visualization library in Python. And sort of the, the thing that differentiates it from Matplotlib and Boca and uh, many others is perhaps the amount of code uh, that you need to write to get a graph especially like even a simple graph and then and then uh yeah so 
One of the reasons for that is it follows the grammar of graphics. And uh, William Headley, one of the people who sort of took these rules, this grammar of graphics, and implemented it in ggplot, um, describes it as like a tool to describe the components of a graphic. So the same way that we have a sentence and we have verbs and we have a structure and uh, all these components, uh, these amazing people <laughs> went and took it uh, and, and tried to describe that with a graph. And then, so Altair is the implementation of that on top of uh, Vega Light. So if you're trying to do like a crazy graphic um, that's sort of out of the ordinary, you'd probably be better using D3. And then if it's more common, like a force graph or an edge bundling graph or something, again, a little bit out there, but but well-known and well-established use cases, uh, you'd use Vega. And these are all JavaScript libraries. And then finally, if you wanted to do some statistics on your, uh, on your data, um, you probably don't need to go so far out there. And there's, um, they've established these rules of, of how to make graphs uh, easily. So Altair is that implementation of uh, Vega Lite, which is, uh, again, in JavaScript. Um, so one of the advantages of Altair is that um, the source data can easily be transformed. And what does that mean is that like Altair basically works in, in three steps. You, uh, you have the data, then you uh, mark it, then you encode it, or if you need to transform it, it would be data, transform, mark, and code. And then finally, if you need to filter it, you would filter it at the end. So that's sort of like the basic building blocks to building a graph in Altair, but it's also, this, we could see that it's a nice generalized rule. The other interesting thing about Altair is um, all the color schemes and a lot of the documentation, um, especially like style documentation is all in uh, Vega Lite or in Vega. And I even went to D3 documentation at some point to do something with, I can't remember, but with dates I wanted to see, and it was in D3. But this is all good because uh, <clears throat> we're not reinventing the wheel here. It's all built on sol solid fundamentals. All right. Um, so a couple of things when you started, or I had difficulties when I started Altair, and still have difficulties, but uh, there's some best practices. If you have over 5,000 uh, rows, or I think, I can't remember if it's rows or data points, um, then you should use, then you need to uh, disable the max rows. And you can just do alt.data transformers, what you see here on the screen. And um, now you can run your notebook or you can run your graph, uh, see your graph with more than 5,000 rows. Uh, problem is that every it's very RAM intensive. The way that that uh, Altair stores its data is according to the Vega specifications, and those specifications, every graph that you do has all the data inside of it, literally all the data inside of it. So you can imagine these notebooks get really really large if you keep on making new and new graphs. So it's a really good practice to just um, <clears throat> make it into a URL. And uh, and reused components, and I'll show you how you uh, basically set up a Altair server in one line of code. All right, so a little bit about the data that we're going to visualize is uh, it's collected every day after 5 p.m. It's uh, I get my there's an important uh, data column here called the imbalance reference price, and that's the price at 1540, which uh, the TSX publishes, um, well, it doesn't publish it, but it publishes on the website where the midpoint was uh, at 1540 when they published the actual imbalance. And we'll sort of go into the details of that. And then with Yahoo Finance, I get close and market sectors and volume. Um, Actually, I find some of the Yahoo data a little more accurate than the TSX and balance price. But I think that's because of the bid ask uh, offer on some of these stocks. So here's just an example of uh, the data that we collected, uh, just a sample. You could see that there's uh, imbalance side can actually have sales and buys, and that's gonna be this uh, fourth column here. Um, it can be sales and buys, and this is, the reference price, and then the size is how many shares um, 
there are to buy or sell uh, at the close. Uh, in an enterprise environment, uh, you would actually get this data through a TSX binary feed. You'd be co-located uh, at the TSX, and you'd use Bloomberg for most of your Yahoo type data. Um, so just a warning, the data hasn't been properly cleaned, and most of the errors, I think, are coming from the reference price. Um, so again, I said no bid ask spreads, midpoints, and all the uh, all the anything you see in dollars is in uh, Canadian dollars. Uh, okay, so here are the requirements, and this is sort of another feature that I like about Altair is if you were using Boca or, or Matplotlib, is that like you'd start importing all these modules within the library, and with Altair, you only have to import two, and then if you have a data server, you would as you can see here, um, you know, you just enable the data server and off you go. So basically, you're just grabbing your data off a URL, and it's not uh, populating in the notebook. Um, the other thing is I talked about reusability, and this is sort of like I had this data frame that I downloaded. Um, from my database, and then I just put it into this um, base.alt, which is a chart. Um, it's just the data itself, actually. All right, so what is the market on closed facility? So think about it this way. There's all these uh, large institutions all over the world, and, and, um, and so they're buying and selling shares for all sorts of customers. They could be, um, they could be, uh, mutual funds, they could be index funds, they could be asset managers, whoever, large large institutions. And they all have uh, needs to, to, maybe they need to raise some cash because a bunch of, because the market's tanking and a bunch of people called up the mutual fund and they wanna liquidate their account. And so now the, uh, the mutual fund needs to sell some shares uh, to fulfill the cash that they need to give their customers. And so the market are closed. The U.S. has the same thing, but it's because it's a more liquid market. Um, it's they, we'll see the impact isn't as big. But the TSX market closed is the last auction that you can do that. So, um, so again, I talked about who uses it, but um, it's like when they can't fulfill their obligations. Then they have. Then they finally say, you know what? I need to sell 500 shares. Or I need to buy 500,000 shares, or whatever the number of shares is, and I have to get it executed by the end of the the trading day. All right. So, um, so basically, I hope you guys can see it. It's a little bit small, but basically, there's about 400 symbols a day that um, trade on the market on close on the uh, on the facility. And uh, on the right-hand side, we can sort of see like a slight distribution of buy minus sells. So you could see that most of the time where there are more buys than sells in the market on close. So now we're gonna look at um, the cap market cap of the companies, the type of companies that trade on the close. And um, you could see that most of, and I can imagine that in the US it's the same thing, but most of our, you know, the, the largest companies in, in Toronto are financial companies, and it's about 10 billion. Um, and then we have basic materials, which are like gold and silver. And, and so Toronto has a ton of these, um, I'll call them small cap stocks that, uh, and you'll see some, some prices are, are like stocks that trade 50 cents um, that, that trade on the MOC. So, how many dollars trade? Like, so what's the daily dollar amount that gets traded every day? And uh, it can get pretty substantial. So we could see that like from, you know, especially like Mar this is March 30, March 31st, which is a end of quarter, um, almost $800 million worth of shares. Uh, there were almost $800 million worth of shares to buy and sell on the close, on the closing prints itself. All right, so how does it work? Um, before 1540, a customer can enter their order, their market on close 
order either as a buy or sell for a particular instrument. After 15, at 1540, the TSX actually publishes to this, the website that we're scraping, but also uh, to their feed. It, and I emphasize random because it's not completely random, but uh, a random sequence of ticker symbols with their uh, imbalance size, uh, with their imbalance size, basically. And we could see here like 34,000 shares, 46,000 shares, uh, 460,000 shares. So it could be, you know, 100 shares and it could be 100,000 shares. And so what... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. That turns. Yeah. All right. And so after 1540, um, we sort of, what happens is that market makers at 1540, what you'll do is that you'll end up buying the stock or selling with the side of the imbalance. And then you'll uh, do the opposite on the closing, on the closing prints. And so here are the returns um, by date of the market of the market on close so this is each uh, circle here is a symbol um so for example this is tev and it's imbalanced price uh imbalance size with 390 shares and um it was an imbalance to sell and the stock went down um and the stock went down to um three dollars and four it went up to three dollars and 49 cents so the 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 side of the imbalance was against the uh the the imbalance direction if you will down below here as you can see uh two returns for um you could see returns for buys and sells according to whether it was an imbalance to sell or an imbalance uh, imbalance to buy and on the left hand, on the right hand side is uh, filter data. So I took away all the preferred stocks. I took all the unit trust stocks away, and it didn't change uh, the shape of the return, or the, it didn't change the density or the, the shape of the return that much. But it did get rid of some uh, outliers. So as you, yeah. so after fifteen forty, all ent all orders are entered. Um, all, or, all orders are entered. And if you want to enter an order for a closing print, it has to be against the market, the imbalance. So if the imbalance side was uh, to buy and you want to sell that particular symbol, then uh, you're allowed to do it. But if the imbalance side was to buy and you want the closing side, you cannot uh, enter a buy market on close. And so uh, I, as you can see, actually, from the graph above, like earlier, that we have these buys and sells. If you literally went with every buy imbalance and with every sell imbalance and then did the opposite on the close, um, you would, you can see, you can make, there's your P&Ls, every day you would make money on, um, it, on, on this trade, basically. And the interesting thing about this is this is like all public information and it's just a, a you know it's a it's a function this trade is a function of um of market constraints of like one liquidity and two uh that people have to do things do things by a certain time uh so here i just started playing around with factors a little bit and i wanted to see like if there was anything um that was like motivating these returns. And we could see that on the right hand side, uh, we have imbalance dollar delta, which is uh, how large. So it's basically mark uh, the imbalance price times the number of shares. And, uh, and you can see here that there's a, a small, there's probably like a positive correlation. So uh, I didn't do any any interactions with Altair. I didn't do any um, any brushing or any of that. Uh, so my next steps are to understand Altair's interactions and transformations. I want to run this with a decision tree and see if we can get better results, and then uh, and then begin implementing a simple reinforcement learning. And so here's my uh, some sources, and uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. 
Awesome. That's Thanks so cool. much, Itai. Can we get uh Itai? Can we give Itai a round of applause in the live chat on YouTube? Yeah. There you go. It's got my applause <laughs> in my apartment. It sounds really sad and empty when I do it here. But yeah, it was great talk. I learned a lot. While we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, I really like the way like Altair makes things very um like interactive. What are some of like the uh like the like versus other uh like using Altair, like what are some advantages of using Altair versus a different uh, visualization library? So um, I was actually going to, you know, I, I had a lot of iterations of this, but I, I wanted to do a bar chart with Boca, like a stacked bar chart with Boca. And let me just go on. Um, well, if, I, if anybody actually wants to, they could just look up stacked bar chart in Boca and you can just see the number of lines of code to do it. And it's, it's daunting. Um, and with it, with Altair, it's like literally four lines of code, basically. I mean, once you get the hang of it, and it it's, took me a little bit, but once you start understanding the rules, the grammar rules, you can uh, go very quickly with Altair. You can get, make very complex uh, graphs, unlike these. Yeah, for sure. It's like, it's amazing how you can do like so much in like a few lines of code. Yeah. Uh, if people are interested in digging deeper, Jake Vanderplass, yeah. who is one of the folks behind Altair, he gave a fantastic tutorial from yeah. PyCon a couple years back. So take a look, a really great way to get started with that library. There's uh, there's two two tutorials that he gave. He gave one in 18 and 2019. And they're both really good. They're both yeah. worth watching. I, I love all the content Jake puts out. He's a fantastic <laughs> asset to the to our data science community. And, uh, and we, actually, just uh, just quickly, he is one of the first people that I saw maybe four or five years ago start print uh, doing blogs in the Jupyter notebook. So yeah, his uh, his blog was a huge inspiration for me to like get started sharing knowledge. Like yeah. It's amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question come in from uh, Joe Jasinski. Yeah. Can you apply different themes to these graphs in Altair? Yeah, so uh, you have um, basically they're the Vega themes. I mean, you can make your own custom themes, but you can just go to the Vega documentation. And um, I have a link for it somewhere up top. But um, yeah. Will you be yeah. able to make you these can, slides available? But there isn't there isn't as many as let's say uh, Seaborn or um, or some of the others. It's it's more limited to, to the number of themes that you can that you have. Cool. But Will you, you be able to share a link through. to these uh, slides so people can go and find that uh, yeah, the different themes? Yeah. Hold on. Let me. Oh, you can see that. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I was going to try to find it. How do I? Okay, awesome. Well, if anybody has any other questions while we're waiting for those to come in, uh, Ita, do you have, uh, I know you gave a talk on Altair, but do you have another, uh, like library or tool that you like using in the Python ecosystem? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I'm actually using Prefect a lot. I think that's the, um, tool that I've been investing the most amount of time in um and uh yeah it's just for workflows basically for awesome yeah i've been hearing a lot of great things for, about prefect actually a lot of great things from you about prefect uh just to give a shout out san francisco python has an event coming up next month and there's going to be a 10 minute talk on prefect there so uh check out their meetup they're a fantastic group uh grace law does an amazing job we actually took a lot of the things that we learned about this live stream from the way they handled uh, their response to COVID. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't look like there are any more questions, but uh, before we do let you go, do you have any... Uh, there we go. Any, uh, did you find it? Yeah, color schemes right there. Okay, awesome. So yeah, Studio, check out yeah. Vega color schemes. Looks like it will just pop up right there. Yeah, and uh, I also do want to get a shout out for the JavaScript. Do you have a preferred JavaScript library for interactive uh, graphs? Thanks to Derek uh, for sending that in. Um, so I tried D3. I mean, I guess I would right now I would use Vega Lite. That would be the, I haven't used it yet, but I have used uh, D3 a lot for network graphs and it's it's really complicated. Like it's just too much code. So I think I, I would probably use Vega Lite for statistical visualizations and then um, 
and and yeah, and that's in JavaScript. Uh, I will. Uh, there's a couple of great projects that are trying to uh, like wrap graphs made in D3, like with React components. So if you do search for like D3 React, there's a couple of great libraries that I was sort of just like playing around with. So Vega, Vega is uh, wraps D3, uses D3 as a layer. Basically. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's just another layer. But yeah, there's yeah. many options out there. Definitely, all of them are great. Uh, before we do let you go, do you have any uh, action items or words of wisdom for our audience? Uh, none. <laughs> uh, what do you mean action, action items like in terms of this project or in general? In general, like keep um, it have fun. Uh, yeah, just uh, keep on learning, you know? Like that's, yeah. that's it. That's cool. Also, but it's like, I also do want to give, uh, you know, like, yes, we're all talking about learning things, but you know what? We also need time to decompress. So if you find yourself sort of like burning it a little bit too much at work and sort of on the side, take that time off to recharge. My company is actually doing uh, a recharge day on Friday where, uh, where none of us are like allowed to work. So uh, it's it's fantastic. So we got a four-day weekend. Isa, are you excited about your four-day weekend? Uh, no, there's no four day weekend. I mean, I I just like doing this stuff. So I yeah, have so no, many tools I want to play with. And like, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again for uh, giving this talk, and we'll see you around. Thank you. Yep. Cool. Well, that brings us to the end of the talk section. If you're still here, you had a good time tonight. Go down there and hit that thumbs up icon. Also, if you have not done so, subscribe to our channel. We have a lot of great content and we're going to be doing some live streams for the pretty much foreseeable future, unfortunately, but it's, it's part of life, but we are trying to deal the best we can. Uh, before we do sign off for the night, let's just uh, make note of our upcoming events. So we have project night tomorrow. So if you go on meetup, sign up, uh, we're going to be meeting in Slack. And based on the kind of things that you want to do, we're going to be breaking off into different groups. Uh, June 2nd is going to be our web dev slash DevOps SIG. Uh, we have two fantastic talks lined up. I might give a lightning talk. We'll see. Uh, June 4th is going to be algorithm SIG. And our main meeting is going to be on June 11th. Uh, Adam Forsyth and Ray Berg, who are both uh, organizers and have given great talks, they're both going to be speaking. And we also have a special guest uh, from New York, Jessica Garson, who's going to be uh, giving a talk. Let's see, what else is there? Oh, uh, yeah. So our next data sig is going to be happening Wednesday, June 17th. It's Chippy Presents Natural Language Processing. Uh, Lorena Mesa is going to be encoring her PyCon talk from uh, last year about uh, telenovela script generation using deep learning. And then we have Ryan Bales uh, encoring his Py, uh, Py Ohio talk, learning from audio data. So I look forward to seeing you there. Also, just give a shout out, Dino 1.0 came out. Looking forward to trying that out. But yeah, that's pretty much it for us. Thanks for joining us. And if you have not done so, please make sure to subscribe so you get notified of our upcoming live streams and a uh, shout out to uh to james uh, jeffries he's been cutting up our live streams into individual videos so it's easier for folks to go and find them uh that's it for us thanks so much and we will see you next time i wish i had some closing music doo, doo, doo.